Chapter 11 of The Spirit of the Age, or Contemporary Portraits, by William Hazlitt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 11 Thomas Malthus Mr. Malthus may be considered as one of those rare and fortunate writers who have attained a scientific reputation in questions of moral and political philosophy. His name undoubtedly stands very high in the present age, and will in all probability go down to posterity with more or less of renown or obloquy. It was said by a person well qualified to judge both from strength and candor of mind that it would take a thousand years at least to answer his work on population. He has certainly thrown a new light on that question and changed the aspect of political economy in a decided and material point of view whether he has not also endeavored to spread a gloom over the hopes and more sanguine speculations of man, and to cast a slur upon the face of nature, is another question. There is this to be said for Mr. Malthus, that in speaking of him, one knows what one is talking about. He is something beyond a mere name. One has not to beat the bush about his talents, his attainments, his vast reputation, and leave off without knowing what it all amounts to. He is not one of those great men who set themselves off and strut and fret an hour upon the stage during a daydream of popularity with the ornaments and jewels borrowed from the common stock to which nothing but their vanity and presumption gives them the least individual claim. He has dug into the mine of truth and brought up ore mixed with dross. In weighing his merits we come at once to the question of what he has done or failed to do. It is a specific claim that he sets up. When we speak of Mr. Malthus, we mean the Essay on Population. And when we mention the Essay on Population, we mean a distinct, leading proposition that stands out intelligibly from all trashy pretense and is a ground on which to fix the levers that may move the world backwards or forwards. He has not left opinion where he found it. He has advanced or given it a wrong bias, or thrown a stumbling block in its way. In a word, his name is not stuck, like so many others, in the firmament of reputation. Nobody knows why, inscribed in great letters, and with a transparency of talents, genius, learning blazing round it, it is tantamount to an idea, it is identified with a principle, it means that the population cannot go on perpetually increasing without pressing on the limits of the means of subsistence, and that a check of some kind or other must, sooner or later, be opposed to it. This is the essence of the doctrine which Mr. Malthus has been the first to bring into general notice, and as we think to establish beyond the fear of contradiction. Admitting then, as we do, the prominence and the value of his claims to public attention, it yet remains a question how far those claims are, as to the talent displayed in them, strictly original, how far, as to the logical accuracy with which he has treated the subject, he has introduced foreign and doubtful matter into it, and how far, as to the spirit in which he has conducted his inquiries and applied a general principle to particular objects, he has only drawn fair and inevitable conclusions from it, or endeavored to tamper with and wrest it to sinister and servile purposes. A writer who shrinks from following up a well-founded principle into its untoward consequences from timidity or false delicacy is not worthy of the name of a philosopher. A writer who assumes the garb of candor and inflexible love of truth to garble and pervert it, to crouch to power and pander to prejudice, deserves a worse title than that of a sophist. Mr. Malthus's first octavo volume on this subject, published in the year 1798, was intended as an answer to Mr. Godwin's inquiry concerning political justice. It was well got up for the purpose, and had an immediate effect. It was what in the language of the ring is called a facer. It made Mr. Godwin and the other advocates of modern philosophy look about them.
It may be almost doubted whether Mr. Malthus was in the first instance serious in many things that he threw out, or whether he did not hazard the whole as an amusing and extreme paradox which might puzzle the reader as it had done himself in an idle moment, but to which no practical consequence whatever could attach. This state of mind would probably continue till the irritation of enemies and the encouragement of friends convinced him that what he had at first exhibited as an idle fancy was in fact a very valuable discovery, or like the toad ugly and venomous, had yet a precious jewel in its head. Such a supposition would at least account for some things in the original essay which scarcely any writer would venture upon except as professed exercises of ingenuity and which have been since in part retracted. But a wrong bias was thus given, and the author's theory was thus rendered warped, disjointed, and sophistical from the very outset. Nothing could in fact be more illogical, not to say absurd, than the whole of Mr. Malthus's reasoning applied as an answer par excellence to Mr. Godwin's book or to the theories of other utopian philosophers. Mr. Godwin was not singular, but was kept in countenance by many authorities, both ancient and modern, in supposing a state of society possible in which the passions and wills of individuals would be conformed to the general good, in which the knowledge of the best means of promoting human welfare and the desire of contributing to it would banish vice and misery from the world, and in which the stumbling blocks of ignorance, of selfishness, and the indulgence of gross appetite being removed, all things would move on by the mere impulse of wisdom and virtue to still a higher and higher degree of perfection and happiness. Compared with the lamentable and gross deficiencies of existing institutions, such a view of futurity as barely possible could not fail to allure the gaze and tempt the aspiring thoughts of the philanthropist and the philosopher. The hopes and the imaginations of speculative men could not but rush forward into this ideal world as into a vacuum of good and from the mighty stream of tendency, as Mr. Wordsworth in the cant of the day calls it, there was danger that the proud monuments of time-hallowed institutions, that the strongholds of power and corruption, that the Corinthian capitals of polished society, with the base and pediments, might be overthrown and swept away as by a hurricane. There were not wanting persons whose ignorance, whose fears, whose pride, or whose prejudices contemplated such an alternative with horror, and who would naturally feel no small obligation to the man who should relieve their apprehensions from the stunning roar of this mighty change of opinion that thundered at a distance, and should be able, by some logical apparatus or unexpected turn of the argument, to prevent the vessel of the state from being hurried forward with the progress of improvement and dashed in pieces down the tremendous precipice of human perfectibility. Then comes Mr. Malthus forward with the geometrical and arithmetical ratios in his hands, and holds them out to his affrighted contemporaries as the only means of salvation. For, so argued the author of the essay, let the principles of Mr. Godwin's inquiry and of other similar works be carried literally and completely into effect. Let every corruption and abuse of power be entirely got rid of. Let virtue, knowledge, and civilization be advanced to the greatest height that these visionary reformers would suppose. Let the passions and appetites be subjected to the utmost control of reason and influence of public opinion. Grant them, in a word, all that they ask, and the more completely their views are realized, the sooner will they be overthrown again, and the more inevitable and fatal will be the catastrophe. For the principle of population will still prevail, and from the comfort, ease, and plenty that will abound, will receive an increasing force and impetus. The number of mouths to be fed will have no limit, but the food that is to supply them cannot keep pace with the demand for it. We must come to a stop somewhere, even though each square yard, by extreme improvements in cultivation, could maintain its man 
in this state of things there will be no remedy. The wholesome checks of vice and misery, which have hitherto kept this principle within bounds, will have been done away. The voice of reason will be unheard. The passions only will bear sway. Famine, distress, havoc, and dismay will spread around. Hatred, violence, war, and bloodshed will be the infallible consequence, and from the pinnacle of happiness, peace, refinement, and social advantage, we shall be hurled once more into a profounder abyss of misery, want, and barbarism than ever by the sole operation of the principle of population. Such is a brief abstract of the argument of the essay. Can anything be less conclusive? A more complete fallacy in petitio principii. Mr. Malthus concedes. He assumes a state of perfectibility such as his opponents imagined, in which the general good is to obtain the entire mastery of individual interests and reason of gross appetites and passions, and then he argues that such a perfect structure of society will fall by its own weight, or rather be undermined by the principle of population, because in the highest possible state of the subjugation of passions to reason, they will be absolutely lawless and unchecked, and because as men become enlightened, quick-sighted, and public-spirited, they will show themselves utterly blind to the consequences of their actions, utterly indifferent to their own well-being and that of all succeeding generations whose fate is placed in their hands. This we conceive to be the boldest paralogism that ever was offered to the world, or palmed upon willing credulity. Against whatever other scheme of reform this objection might be valid, the one it was brought expressly to overturn was impregnable against it, invulnerable to its slightest graze. Say that the utopian reasoners are visionaries, unfounded, that the state of virtue and knowledge they suppose, in which reason shall have become all in all, can never take place, that it is inconsistent with the nature of man, and with all experience, well and good, but to say that society will have attained this high and palmy state, that reason will have become the master key to all our motives, and that when arrived at its greatest power, it will cease to act at all, but will fall down dead, inert, and senseless before the principle of population, is an opinion which one would think few people would choose to advance or assent to without strong inducements for maintaining or believing it. The fact, however, is that Mr. Malthus found this argument entire, the principle and the application of it, in an obscure and almost forgotten work published about the middle of the last century, entitled Various Prospects of Mankind, Nature, and Providence, by a Scotch gentleman of the name of Wallace. The chapter in this work on the principle of population, considered as a bar to all ultimate views of human improvement, was probably written to amuse an idle hour, or read as a paper to exercise the wits of some literary society in the northern capital, and no farther responsibility or importance annexed to it. Mr. Malthus, by adopting and setting his name to it, has given it sufficient currency and effect. It sometimes happens that one writer is the first to discover a certain principle or lay down a given observation, and that another makes an application of or draws a remote or an immediate inference from it, totally unforeseen by the first, and from which, in all probability, he might have widely dissented. But this is not so in the present instance. Mr. Malthus has borrowed, perhaps without consciousness, at any rate without acknowledgment, both the preliminary statement that the increase and the supply of food from a limited earth and a limited fertility must have an end, while the tendency to increase in the principle of population has none, without some external and forcible restraint on it, and the subsequent use made of this statement as an insuperable bar to all schemes of utopian or progressive improvement. Both these he has borrowed whole from Wallace, with all their imperfections on their heads, and has added more and greater ones to them out of his own store, 
In order to produce something of a startling and dramatic effect, he has strained a point or two. In order to quell and frighten away the bugbear of modern philosophy, he was obliged to make a sort of monster of the principle of population, which was brought into the field against it, and which was to swallow it up quick. No half-measures, no middle course of reasoning would do. With a view to meet the highest possible power of reason in the new order of things, Mr. Malthus saw the necessity of giving the greatest possible physical weight to the antagonist principle, and he accordingly lays it down that its operation is mechanical and irresistible. He premises these two propositions as the basis of all his reasoning. Number one, that food is necessary to man, Number two, that the desire to propagate the species is an equally indispensable law of our existence, thus making it appear that these two wants or impulses are equal and coordinate principles of action. If this double statement had been true, the whole scope and structure of his reasoning, as hostile to human hopes and sanguine speculations, would have been irrefragible. But as it is not true, the whole in that view falls to the ground. According to Mr. Malthus's octavo edition, the sexual passion is as necessary to be gratified as the appetite of hunger, and a man can no more exist without propagating his species than he can live without eating. Were it so, neither of these passions would admit of any excuses, any delay, any restraint from reason or foresight, and the only checks to the principle of population must be vice and misery. The argument would be triumphant and complete, but there is no analogy, no parity in the two cases, such as our author here assumes. No man can live for any length of time without food. Many persons live all their lives without gratifying the other sense. The longer the craving after food is unsatisfied, the more violent, imperious, and uncontrollable the desire becomes. Whereas the longer the gratification of the sexual passion is resisted, the greater force does habit and resolution acquire over it. And, generally speaking, it is a well-known fact, attested by all observation in history, that this latter passion is subject more or less to control from personal feelings and character, from public opinions and the institutions of society, so as to lead either to a lawful and regulated indulgence, or to partial or total abstinence, according to the dictates of moral restraint which latter check to the inordinate excesses and unheard-of consequences of the principle of population, our author, having no longer an extreme case to make out, admits and is willing to patronize in addition to the two former and exclusive ones of vice and misery in the second and remaining editions of his work. Mr. Malthus has shown some awkwardness or even reluctance in softening down the harshness of his first peremptory decision. He sometimes grants his grand exception cordially, proceeds to argue stoutly, and to try conclusions upon it. At other times he seems disposed to cavil about or retract it. The influence of moral restraint is very inconsiderable or none at all. It is indeed difficult, more particularly for so formal and nice a reasoner as Mr. Malthus, to piece such contradictions plausibly or gracefully together. We wonder how he manages it, how anyone should attempt it. The whole question, the gist of the argument of his early volume, turned upon this, whether vice and misery were the only actual or possible checks to the principle of population. He then said they were, and farewell to building castles in the air. He now says that moral restraint is to be coupled with these, and that its influence depends greatly on the state of laws and manners, and utopia stands where it did, a great way off indeed, but not turned topsy-turvy by our magician's wand. Should we ever arrive there, that is, attain to a state of perfect moral restraint, we shall not be driven headlong back into Epicurus's style for want of the only possible checks to population, vice and misery. And in proportion as we advance that way, that is, as the influence of moral restraint is extended, 
the necessity for vice and misery will be diminished instead of being increased according to the first alarm given by the essay. Again, the advance of civilization and population in consequence with the same degree of moral restraint as there exists in England at this present time, for instance, is a good and not an evil, but this does not appear from the essay. The essay shows that population is not, as had been sometimes taken for granted, an abstract and unqualified good, but it led many persons to suppose that it was an abstract and unqualified evil, to be checked only by vice and misery, and producing, according to its encouragement, a greater quantity of vice and misery, and this air the author has not been at sufficient pains to do away. Another thing in which Mr. Malthus attempted to clench Wallace's argument was in giving to the disproportionate power of increase in the principle of population and the supply of food a mathematical form, or reducing it to the arithmetical and geometrical ratios in which we believe Mr. Malthus is now generally admitted, even by his friends and admirers, to have been wrong. There is evidently no inherent difference in the principle of increase in food or population, since a grain of corn, for example, will propagate and multiply itself much faster even than the human species. A bushel of wheat will sow a field. That field will furnish seed for twenty others, so that the limit to the means of subsistence is only the want of room to raise it in, or, as Wallace expresses it, a limited fertility and a limited earth. Up to the point where the earth, or any given country, is fully occupied or cultivated, the means of subsistence naturally increases in a geometrical ratio and will more than keep pace with the natural and unrestrained progress of population, and beyond that point they do not go on increasing, even in Mr. Malthus's arithmetical ratio, but are stationary or nearly so. So far, then, is the proportion from being universally and mathematically true, that in no part of the world or state of society does it hold good. But our theorist, by laying down this double ratio as a law of nature, gains this advantage, that at all times it seems as if, whether in new or old peopled countries, in fertile or barren soils, the population was pressing hard on the means of subsistence, and again it seemed as if the evil increased with the progress of improvement in civilization. Or if you cast your eye at the scale which is supposed to be calculated upon trust and infallible data, you find that when the population is at eight, the means of subsistence are at four, so that here there is only a deficit of one half, but when it is at thirty-two, they have only got to six, so that here there is a difference of twenty-six in thirty-two, and so on in proportion. The farther we proceed, the more enormous is the mass of vice and misery we must undergo as a consequence of the natural excess of the population over the means of subsistence and as a salutary check to its farther desolating progress. The mathematical table placed at the front of the essay therefore leads to a secret suspicion, or barefaced assumption, that we ought in mere kindness and compassion to give every sort of indirect and underhand encouragement, to say the least, to the providential checks of vice and misery, as the sooner we arrest this formidable and paramount evil in its course, the less opportunity we leave it of doing incalculable mischief. Accordingly, whenever there is the least talk of colonizing new countries, of extending the population, or adding to social comforts and improvements, Mr. Malthus conjures up his double ratios, and insists on the alarming results of advancing them a single step forward in the series. By the same result it would be better to return at once to a state of barbarism, and to take the benefit of acorns and scuttlefish as a security against the luxuries and wants of civilized life. But it is not our ingenious author's wish to hint at or recommend any alterations in existing institutions, and he is therefore silent on that unpalatable part of the subject and natural inference from his principles. Mr. Malthus's gospel is preached to the poor. He lectures them on economy, on morality, 
the regulation of their passions, which, he says, at other times are amenable to no restraint, and on the ungracious topic that the laws of nature, which are the laws of God, have doomed them and their families to starve for want of a right to the smallest portion of food beyond what their labor will supply, or some charitable hand may hold out in compassion. This is illiberal, and it is not philosophical. The laws of nature, or of God, to which the author appeals, are no other than a limited fertility and a limited earth. Within those bounds, the rest is regulated by the laws of man. The division of the produce of the soil, the price of labor, the relief afforded to the poor, are matters of human arrangement. While any charitable hand can extend relief, it is a proof that the means of subsistence are not exhausted in themselves, that the tables are not full. Mr. Malthus says that the laws of nature, which are the laws of God, have rendered that relief physically impossible, and yet he would abrogate the poor laws by an act of the legislature in order to take away that impossible relief which the laws of God deny and which the laws of man actually afford. We cannot think that this view of his subject, which is prominent and dwelt on at great length and with much pertinacity, is dictated either by rigid logic or melting charity. A laboring man is not allowed to knock down a hare or a partridge that spoils his garden. A country squire keeps a pack of hounds. A lady of quality rides out with a footman behind her on two sleek, well-fed horses. We have not a word to say against all this as exemplifying the spirit of the English Constitution, as a part of the law of the land, or as an artificial distribution of light and shade in the social picture. But if any one insists at the same time that the laws of nature which are the laws of God have doomed the poor and their families to starve, because the principle of population has encroached upon and swallowed up the means of subsistence, so that not a mouthful of food is left by the grinding law of necessity for the poor, we beg leave to deny both the fact and inference, and we put it to Mr. Malthus whether we are not, in strictness, justified in doing so. We have perhaps said enough to explain our feeling on the subject of Mr. Malthus's merits and defects. We think he had the opportunity and the means in his hands of producing a great work on the principle of population, but we believe he has let it slip from his having an eye to other things besides that broad and unexplored question. He wished not merely to advance to the discovery of certain great and valuable truths, but at the same time to overthrow certain unfashionable paradoxes by exaggerated statements to curry favor with existing prejudices and interests by garbled representations. He has, in other words, as it appears to us on a candid retrospect and without any feeling of controversial asperity rankling in our minds, sunk the philosopher and the friend of his species, a character to which he might have aspired, in the sophist and party writer. The period at which Mr. Malthus came forward teemed with answers to modern philosophy, with antidotes to liberty and humanity, with abusive histories of the Greek and Roman republics, with fulsome panegyrics to the Roman emperors, at the very time when we were reviling Bonaparte for his strides to universal empire, with the slime and offal of desperate servility and we cannot but consider the essay as one of the poisonous ingredients thrown into the cauldron of legitimacy to make it thick and slab. Our author has indeed so far done service to the cause of truth that he has counteracted many capital errors formerly prevailing as to the universal and indiscriminate encouragement of population under all circumstances. But he has countenanced opposite errors, which if adopted in theory and practice would be even more mischievous, and has left it to future philosophers to follow up the principle that some check must be provided for the unrestrained progress of population into a set of wiser and more humane consequences.
Mr. Godwin has lately attempted an answer to the essay, thus giving Mr. Malthus a Roland for his Oliver, but we think he has judged ill in endeavouring to invalidate the principle instead of confining himself to point out the misapplication of it. There is one argument introduced in this reply which will perhaps amuse the reader as a sort of metaphysical puzzle. It has sometimes occurred to me whether Mr. Malthus did not catch the first hint of his geometrical ratio from a curious passage of Judge Blackstone on the consanguinity which is as follows. The doctrine of lineal consanguinity is sufficiently plain and obvious but it is at the first view astonishing to consider the number of lineal ancestors which every man has within no very great number of degrees, and so many different bloods is a man said to contain in his veins, as he hath lineal ancestors. Of these he hath two in the first ascending degree, his own parents. He hath four in the second, the parents of his father and the parents of his mother, he hath eight in the third, the parents of his two grandfathers and two grandmothers, and by the same rule of progression he hath an hundred and twenty-eight in the seventh, a thousand and twenty-four in the tenth, and at the twentieth degree, or the distance of twenty generations, every man hath above a million of ancestors, a common arithmetic will demonstrate. This will seem surprising to those who are unacquainted with the increasing power of progressive numbers, but is palpably evident from the following table of geometrical progression, in which the first term is 2 and the denominator also 2, or, to speak more intelligibly, it is evident for that each of us has two ancestors in the first degree the number of which is doubled at every remove, because each of our ancestors had also two ancestors of his own. A chart of lineal degrees, number of ancestors, first degree, two, second degree, four, third degree, eight, fourth degree, sixteen, fifth degree, thirty-two, sixth degree, sixty-four, seventh degree, one hundred and twenty-eight, 8th degree, 256, ninth degree, 512, 10th degree, 1024, 11th degree, 2048, 12th degree, 4096, 13th degree, 8192, 14th degree, 16384, 15th degree, 32,768, 16th degree, 65,536, 17th degree, 131,072, 18th degree, 262,144, 19th degree, 524,288, 20th degree, 1 million, 48,576. End of chart. This argument, however, proceeds Mr. Godwin, from Judge Blackstone of a geometrical progression would much more naturally apply to Montesquieu's hypothesis of the depopulation of the world, and prove that the human species is hastening fast to extinction than to the purpose for which Mr. Malthus has employed it. An ingenious sophism might be raised upon it to show that the race of mankind will ultimately terminate in unity. Mr. Malthus indeed should have reflected that it is much more certain that every man has had ancestors than that he will have posterity, and that it is still more doubtful whether he will have posterity to twenty or to an indefinite number of generations. End of quotation from The Inquiry Concerning Population, page 100. Mr. Malthus's style is correct and elegant, his tone of controversy mild and gentlemanly, and the care with which he has brought his facts and documents together deserves the highest praise. He has lately quitted his favorite subject of population and broke a lance with Mr. Ricardo on the question of rent and value. The partisans of Mr. Ricardo, who are also the admirers of Mr. Malthus, say that the usual sagacity of the latter 
has here failed him, and that he has shown himself to be a very illogical writer. To have said this of him formerly, on another ground, was accounted a heresy, and a piece of presumption not easily to be forgiven. Indeed, Mr. Malthus has always been a sort of darling in the public eye, whom it was unsafe to meddle with. He has contrived to make himself as many friends by his attacks on the schemes of human perfectibility and on the poor laws, as Mandeville formerly procured enemies by his attacks on human perfections and on charity schools. And among other instances that we might mention, Plug Pulteney, the celebrated miser of whom Mr. Burke said on his having a large estate left him that now it was to be hoped he would set up a pocket handkerchief, was so enamored with the saving schemes and humane economy of the essay that he desired a friend to find out the author and offer him a church living. This liberal intention was by design or accident unhappily frustrated. End of chapter 11